I was talking to a Noahide individual in the last 24 hour period who mentioned something that I have heard and seen from Noahide people many, many times over the years that I've been involved in the Noahide circles. And that is the feeling that my laws are not good enough. The seven Noahide laws are just meh. You know, it's like be an, a decent human being. Thank you. Thank you. I came all this way. I discovered Hashem. I'm studying Torah to what? To do the things I was going to do anyway, to not murder, to not commit adultery, to not steal. Like, that's it? That's it? This is, this is my whole portion over here. I want more. I want Shabbat. I want the festivals. I want kosher. I want tzitzit, tefillin, mezuzah. I want all the things that the Jews are doing because what I have is not good enough. And I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad right now. And there's a whole question whether Noahide is allowed to do more than he's commanded or not. I'm not going to enter that sparring field, okay? But regardless of that, do you hear what you're doing do you hear what you're doing? I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad, but I want to encourage you. When I'm trying to say something very positive and encouraging, a person who doesn't murder because it's a societal norm, he doesn't commit adultery because it's a societal norm, he doesn't steal because it's against the law or whatever, he's just fitting in, he's doing what he was raised to do, he's doing what he was regulated to do, what he was habituated to, to do, he's being a Pavlovian dog, right? Everyone just walks and does... I agree with you. That's not very impressive. But when the Ben Noah has the opportunity to say, I'm not going to be a murderer because my God commands me so. I'm not going to commit these despicable acts because I'm doing so as part of my relationship with God as a commandment directly from him to me. I have a relationship with God and this is what it is. He elevates that act to something much, much greater. And when we look down at those laws, when we look down at the Noahide laws, we're, we're making them light. We're making them light. We're putting them under the heel. We're going, eh, it's not good enough. I want Shabbat. I want this. I want that. Okay, those are nice things. I have to do them. I love them. They're, they're amazing. I, I love, love, love Torah and mitzvahs. Love, 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 love. It's great. But if that's not your portion, don't make light of your portion. Love the Noahide commandments. Embrace them. Don't make them light. Don't make them light. So in other words, Ekev Tishma'un, these are the, the, here's the point I'm trying to make. Listen, I'm going to say it a different way. Your mitzvos are the mitzvos that are the light ones that are thrown under the heel. Not because people don't perform them. People aren't going around murdering nonstop. Yet some people are. In other words, society more or less is following this without being a Noahide. It's true. But most people relegate it to that. They say these commandments are no big deal. Everyone's doing them anyway. They are light. So it's not that I'm not performing them, but I'm lowering the importance of them. I'm lowering the significance of them. I'm making them light and I'm throwing them under my heel and saying, yeah, yeah, don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery. I get it. What's the big deal? What's the big deal? We're committing a travesty when we do that and say, no. These are God-given laws. These are gifts from Hashem. He wants to connect you through that. You're gonna, you're gonna disdain that. You're gonna lower it. You're gonna throw it on the floor and say that's light. No, Akif Tishma'un, listen to what's under your heel. Pick up your foot and pick up those Noahide commandments and say these are amazing. They come to me from God. I, I was taking, I was taking them for granted along and said, what's the big deal? It's a huge deal. These are a huge deal, people. These are such a huge deal. Embrace what you have. Love it. Delight in it. Every time you see your neighbor and you don't jab a, a, a knife through his chest, you go, God, I love you. I'm not murdering. Do a happy dance in your house <laughs> right. every time you don't steal. Do, do j Be joyous in the fact that you're loyal to your spouse. You could find so much meaning in these commandments. Don't throw them under your heel. Don't throw them under your heel. I'll tell a quick story. It's a quick story. Maybe two stories. <laughs> Take your time. Hey, you can use as much time as you like. I don't, short. Not, yep. Short. Go ahead. There was once a story I heard from my Rebbe, Rav Daniel Belsky, should live and be well. Uh, he, he said, I, I, and I remember the details. So he said there was once a, a, you know, a man, he was walking through a, the street where a house had burned down. 
in a little Jewish ghetto, a little Jewish shtetl in Europe. And there was a fellow jumping up and down on top of the rubble. And he's jumping up and down doing a happy dance. He's so glad and he's so happy. And he's jumping, dancing and singing. And the guy says, sees, he's walking by and he sees him. Who are you? What are you doing? Why are you being a meshuggah? And why are you being, what's wrong with you? He says, he says, this is my house. And he says, yeah, I see it. Why are you jumping? He says, it's a burnt down. He goes, yeah, I still don't understand why you're jumping and singing. And then he says, I lost everything. I lost everything. Everything I had gone. And the guy says, uh, so why are you happy? He says, because I lost everything I have. And I'm still a Jew. <laughs> Meaning that can never be taken away from you. You don't need to be a Jew. The point is, he said, I recognize that I have I have a soul given to me from Hashem and he loves me and I'm connected to him. And nothing that happens to me can ever take that away. So understand that about yourself. I'm a human being. I'm a Ben Noah. I have a connection with Hashem. I have a soul from him. He loves me. He gave me seven commandments and no one can take those away. And I'm so happy. I'm so happy that I have that. Don't make it light. Don't make it light. Last story, a little bit on a sadder note. I don't know if this was Viktor Frankl or not. He has a very similar story, but I heard this story told about a Jew in the Holocaust that was taken to the concentration camps, separated from his family. Every every family member he had was killed, parents, siblings. If he had a wife and kids, gone. Everything gone. They put him on the line to get, uh, you know, deloused or whatever. They had him stripped naked. He had, they took all his property, all his money, everything. He had nothing. Naked, bare, no family, no possessions. Barely had his dignity. And they told him to jump into a pool of chemicals. He had to jump into a pool of chemicals to, like, uh, sterilize him, to, like, delouse him, whatever it was. And he jumps in. This is the way I heard the story. And the chemicals are burning his skin. And he's so miserable. He's so miserable. He's like, they took everything from me. My father, my mother, my sisters, my brothers, my wife, my children, my clothing. They took everything from me. Here I am naked in this pool of, of burning chemicals. I'm just I'm totally engulfed in pain. I said, what do I have left in this world? And now Viktor Frankl, he has this whole thing about man's search for meaning. You'll have to explore Viktor Frankl, but he, but the way I heard the story from a rabbi was he realized, he says, I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew, and no matter what they do to me, they can never take that away from me. They can never, the Nazis can never, and will never take away from me that I am a Jew. And he said he wanted to drown himself and never come out of this pool and die right there until he had this thought that they can never take away from me the fact that I'm a Jew. And he came out of the pool and he went on with as much strength as he could muster and he ultimately survived the war but this thought whether you look at it from the sad story perspective or the happy story the guy jumping up and down in his burnt rubble of his house and whether you're a jew or you're not a jew you have a soul you have a connection with the creator he loves you and he's giving you a great gift whatever it is whatever that gift is if it's seven mitzvahs don't look at it as they're just seven mitzvahs, and they're kind of boring because they're all the things I would have been doing anyway, and I need more. You're making a big mistake. You're making a big mistake. Don't make what God gave you light. Don't make the commandments light. Make them heavy. So, ekev tishmoon. Listen to what's under your heel. Pick up your heel. Pick up those mitzvahs you threw on the floor and you crushed under your foot. Pick them up and lift them up and do a happy dance with them. And then God says, if you listen to these commandments that were under your heel, but you pick them up and you put them in their proper place and you hold them up to where they belong, belong to be held and fulfill them with joy, he says, then you will be the recipient of all the rewards and all the goodness I have to offer. Okay, I'll stop talking now. That that was that was very enlightening. Thank you for that. You know, it kind of goes along with the old idea of trust. I mean, I tell my kids all the time, if I can't trust you with the small things, then how can I trust you with the bigger things? You know, the small things are really, really important. So, Right, 100%. I actually was going to say this when I was talking about the idea of, okay, well, in the end of the day, what's the big deal if I ignore a light mitzvah? Okay, so it's just a light mitzvah, right? So what – 
what we find is, and I, I was saying this, that when you ignore the light, it creates a foundation to build on top of it heavier and heavier and heavier sins. Ooh, well said, yeah. So, but, but the proof of this, I was actually, I'm going to quote to you something that I put in my notes. It's very well known. I grew up in New York City. It was well known in the 80s. Like, I didn't see it, but there was this movie they put out, like the Joker movie, which made a lot of money. Uh, supposed to be a very good film. I don't, I don't watch movies, but I, I, I heard a little bit about it. So it takes place in New York in like the late uh, 70s or 80s. It's like the time I grew up when New York was like a cesspool of crime and vice, a real disgusting place to live. And in my lifetime, I'm, I'm still alive, but when I was a kid in the 90s, we had Mayor Giuliani. Now, Mayor Giuliani, like him or hate him, and that's basically how people feel about him, whether you love him or hate him, he came in and he cleaned up the city. He made you Times Square used to be like drugs and prostitutes. He turned it into this beautiful place, thriving with business and tourists. And it's where you wanted to go, whether you were a tourist visiting New York or you were a new person living in New York. You wanted to go to Times Square. It was such a wonderful place to be. But only after Giuliani cleaned it up. How did he do it? How did he do it? Why did everyone else fail in their crime fighting strategy until Giuliani? So it's very well. I'm going to read to you something from uh, How New York Became Safe, the full story. This is an article in City Journal uh, 2009. A short, short quote it says, as New York suffered, an idea began to emerge that would one day restore the city. Nathan Glazer first gave it voice in a 1979 public interest article, quote, on subway graffiti in New York. Um, an, ar an article on Subway Graffiti in New York, that's the name of the article, arguing that graffitists, other disorderly persons, and criminals who rob, rape, assault, and murder passengers are part of one world of uncontrollable predators. Meaning, until then, it was looked at like, well, this is the, the graffiti guys, right? They're, they're disorderly persons, whatever. But the, And then there's the rob, rape, and murder guys. We need to go after the rob, rape, and murder guys. We don't have the time, resources, effort, whatever, energy to go after the graffitists and the disorderly persons. We're going to leave them alone. So that low-level crime ran rampant while they fought the high-level crime. They never got control of the high-level crime. Why? Continuing the quote, he says, for Glazer, this is the guy who wrote that article, a government's inability to control even a minor crime like graffiti signaled to its citizens that it certainly couldn't handle more serious ones. Disorder, therefore, was creating a crisis that threatened all segments of urban life. In other words, if you ignore the low-level crime, you're signaling to the entire society that this is a society that tolerates crime. And then the higher level criminals are emboldened and energized to commit higher level crimes. So when you focus on the higher level crime and you ignore the low, lower level crime, you're just getting into a cycle that's never going to end. Giuliani learned from this new, new um, philosophy that was emerging in crime control, and that's what he implemented. I remember he started ticketing jaywalkers. Jaywalkers means you cross the street when the light is red or you don't go at a crosswalk, you go kind of in the middle of the block, in the middle of traffic, you wait and you cross. The cops started stopping and ticketing people, $25 every time they did that. They were like, who is this Giuliani guy? He's a dictator. He's going to ticket us. It's illegal. It's illegal. It's on the books, but no one was enforcing it. They had street vendors selling hot dogs on corners. They didn't have a business license to stand on that corner selling hot dogs and soda. They, they, they arrested those people. They said, you're committing a crime. Get off the street corner. There were squeegee guys at the – at the intersections, at the traffic lights, you would stop your car, they'd come up to your car, they'd start washing your window, and then you'd give them two bucks through the window, thanks for washing my window. They didn't have a license to practice business like that over there. They were arrested, they were arrested. These low level crimes, the graffitists, these guys were taken off the streets, the streets were cleaned. Suddenly you looked around like, this is a crime free city. The other criminals didn't have, at that point, the invitation to go ahead and commit crimes because the whole environment spoke, this is a crime-free place. Why? Because you got rid of all that low-level visible crime. So when you got rid of the mitzvos kalos, right? Akiv, that's where Giuliani learned Parshas Akiv. He says, we've been dashing under our heels 
these low-level crimes saying it's no big deal, but that was the, the invitation for the high-level crime. If I get rid of the low-level crime, if I target that, the other crime will go away. And he was right. He did that, and New York became a clean city. This continued throughout the time of his uh, successor, Mayor Bloomberg. And unfortunately, when the Dems came back in, it was all downhill from there. Wow. Now New York is a nightmare again. But that's the idea. Giuliani understood it. Glazer, this guy Glazer, Nathan Glazer, he understood Akif Tishmoon. If you take care of the low level stuff, everything else falls into place. But if you dismiss the low level stuff, everything else falls out of place. That's the idea. That is brilliant, actually. Very, very brilliant. Unbelievable. So that was that was like a little ingredient I was thinking to add to the class, but we ran out of time and then you, <laughs> you, you sort of gave me that invitation. So yes. So I, I offered it here to to just confirm what you said about what you said to your son. You know, the same exact idea nice. has sort of been proven on a large scale when it comes to fighting crime in a in a in a big uh, urban city. Very good. Well, I tell you what, there's a lot of really excellent comments. You need to go back in and, uh, yeah, actually you'll be able to go in after the fact. But anyway, <laughs> brings me to the point. A lot of compliments on your sure today. That was really awesome. Really, uh, really awesome stories. We love the stories, by the way, so bring as many of those as you like. Those help us connect better, you know what I mean? It gives us something, uh, something real in our hand, tangible, that we can actually work with. So it's really nice. So, very good. Okay, so thank you all for tuning in. It's been fun. Uh, Rabbi, thank you for your time. You're awesome as well. And uh, and we will see you guys same time, same place as Shim Willing next week. Um, and so, uh, most of you know this by now, that after the show ends, this video will no longer be available. Uh, I'm, I'll edit it tomorrow and have it replay again a second time as live, even though it's a replay, as live. So, you, so those who didn't get to watch it tonight can actually watch it live tomorrow. That video will be the one that stays available for everyone else. Uh, later on, if you want to come back and watch the original video, you got to come and click the join button. There's little special perks there for it. So you'll see the original chat as well. So you all have a wonderful night. And Rabbi, once again, you're amazing. We love you. And we'll talk to you all soon. Shalom, shalom, everybody. And we'll take you on the other side. Have a good night.